Thanks. Yay. Hello. Sorry for the delay. Um, let's see. Will someone put a comment in to let me know that you can <laughs> see me? Since I know I, I'm looking at a screen and I don't see other humans. Oh, good. Okay, great. Thank you. We had a little, um, some mashugana, which is an excellent Yiddish word for crazy townness. And um, now the camera's working, the mic's working. Um, all right, so uh, thanks for joining me for those of you that are here live. And uh, as it was described, we're going to just have a kind of casual discussion about ways to thrive during this holiday season which i know for myself in california the you know governor is about to uh really restrict people again very very significantly about you know what they do to try to slow down the current wave of um, covid and so um with that being the case you know we're in a really different holiday situation in some ways it might be healthier for people in some ways it might be not as healthy for people and um so i'd love to hear your questions i had you know at some level the only comment i want to start with is just to acknowledge that from the ayurvedic perspective the you have five senses that you feed and so of course you have your your skin and you have your hearing and you have your eyes and you have your tongue that tastes food and you have your sense of smell and so one of the things that's very common this time of year especially you know cold and flu season has definitely begun and then holiday treats are quite ubiquitous but this year people are in lockdown so it's a totally different situation and in some ways there's less probably temptation to you know eat indiscriminately or have too much sugar or something like that but at the same time we're um it, we're also de being deprived of some of the really meaningful and basic things about this time of the year which is gathering with loved ones to um to you know be together and celebrate the light and celebrate whatever um holidays you know are meaningful to us and celebrate the new year and celebrate the solstice. And so my sort of first recommendation is that recognize that you have five senses and make all of December a kind of, um, a, a kind of practice to really uh, indulge your senses. And I would say especially the senses beyond your sense of taste so touch and sight and smell and sounds like really take time each day especially if you're spending a lot of time solo or you're spending time with just a few people at your home or your your dwelling or where you happen to be staying right now um, to really like enhance your sensual experience because that's one of the most direct ways to make a really nourishing experience and a joyful experience out of whatever you might find yourself doing or the environment that you're in. Um, so that's just one comment to start with and I'd love to get questions and then I'll, I'll use those to sort of, uh, you know, uh, hopefully provide some, some good, good input about how to, how to go through this period of time in the best way. So if you have questions, you can enter them in the, the sidebar. And if I don't see any questions pop up, I'll start uh, making some other comments.
So one thing while I'm waiting to see, you know, what might be coming in for questions. Okay. It, so, so Sean, if in partnership suggestions too, could you be more specific? But I was going to say one thing about this season is, is the temperature drops. You know, almost everywhere the temperature is cooler in the, if you're north of the equator. Um, and thanks, Ashley. I'll get to that in a moment. And, um, but it's just to embrace cold, to actively embrace it, but not so much like randomly. There's a, there's a big distinction here, which would be it's a really good idea to not leave your house with your head wet if it's cold outside. And if you do happen to leave your house with your head wet, definitely cover up. Cover up with a, a scarf and a, and a beanie until your hair dries because having wet hair and cold air is one of the easiest ways to weaken your immune system. The other thing that you can consider is um, to um, use cold water at the end of your showers. And this is a really well-known technique that's been popularized by um, the bio uh, hacking, which I really don't like that term, but the biohacking crew. And there's a lot of great science about how it benefits your brain health, but it also really, really profoundly benefits your immune health. So this is one of those situations where you're in the shower and you've gotten very warm because you've been in the shower, and then you add that cold water, really cold water at the very end, like maximum cold water for about 30 seconds, especially from the chest up, that means head, shoulders, chest. Doing that is one of the best ways to ensure that you're, you'll get an immune system upgrade every time you shower, and that's a wonderful way to, to set yourself up. All right, so now I'm getting some questions, and I'll jump into um, some answers. So let's see here. Um, yeah, so in partnership with the, with the five senses, Sean, you had to take this into the, uh, the sexy realm right away. Okay, so... Um, Definitely winter time is the best time for cuddling, you know, so um, one of the things, for example, especially if your mood, if you're feeling, you know, uh, like you're really struggling with mood, one of the best things you can do with a partner is really, really light touch, kind of like when you're giving somebody the chills. And if you do that over the whole body, um, it really boosts oxytocin levels and for everybody when you have higher oxytocin levels in your system you're going to feel more connected you're going to feel more secure you're going to feel more safe in whatever environment you're in so that's a nice that's a nice touch experience and then um, you know outside of that it's the kind of things too like I think that um, you know something that is a beautiful way to connect as partners Another great way is through sound, to actually chant or sing together where you're actually in a space and you're really listening to each other, the sound of each other as you sing or chant. And that, um, that you know, is, a, is a, an incredible way to feel connected without actually being, you know, without actually touching. Another thing is, uh, you know, with the sense of taste would be ask your partner what kind of What's their favorite meal or what's the what's one of their favorite dishes and then make sure to make that regularly <laughs> or, you know, make it something where you're having, um, you know, really a, a very, uh, you know, sort of intentional cooking uh, experience together where you're really trying to please each other with what you cook. I recently heard some advice from uh, uh, an intimacy and sex coach who said it's good for anybody in a relationship to plan a three-hour sex date once a week. So you have three hours that's just devoted as a couple to, to you know, your sex life and to having an extended sexual experience. So I, th I, I support that too for couples, for sure. So those are a few suggestions. And then um, Ashley's asking about general suggestions for protection when living in a big city. Um, you know, in the big city, the two of the main factors have to do with cities are concrete. And concrete really is a very vata-provoking 
kind of influence, and for those of you that are less savvy with Ayurveda, you can think of a vata provoking influence as being anything that is going to amplify um, wind and cold. And so, for example, I know that this is absolutely true in San Francisco. San Francisco is a very cold city, and it has to do with, you know, it's a city, so it has a lot of concrete, but you also have the, a very cold ocean off the coast, and it, it tends to draw a lot of kind of diurnal wind and cold and fog into the city. So with people in the city, a very simple orientation is you want to be extra careful about protecting Vata Dosha. So one way to do that is to make sure that you're staying warm when you're out, like really sort of protect yourself. Obviously with, you know, in, in right now, you know, many internal environments are being actually closed to public interaction. And so, um, but when you're outside, you know, stay warm. And then the other thing too is when you're, when you're moving, move slowly. Don't, don't get into any kind of urgency or, or f you kind of uh, a harried experience when you're out. And ideally that means you plan wherever you're going so you can get there in time and all that kind of thing. But you know what I mean? It's like all of the ways that Vata can be balanced are antidotes to city life. Um, the other thing that's a good idea is that in cities you're often in, you know, uh, people are close together, the buildings are close together, so you want to really make sure the air quality is really good in your space. And so that would mean potentially getting something that's like a HEPA filter. Also burning essential, or burning incense or essential oils, like really high quality. Um, you know, incense and essential oils can both be, have, you know, artificial additives, so get a pure source. But, um, you know, some of the best scents for this time of year are the really aromatic ones like eucalyptus, mint, um, clove, uh, copal, or some of our frankincense, um, myrrh, those kind of, you know, those resins. And copal is a resin that's in that same family, but it's from Mexico. I find personally that um, I will, I will burn copal or sage on a near daily basis in the winter because it definitely has a kind of um, antimicrobial effect in my space. It's going to help keep um, you know, the air conditioned around keeping the microbial communities kind of in check. And then the other thing is also, and this is also something to do intentionally, is open those windows and flush the place out. You know, and that's where you might bundle up, especially if it's freezing cold outside where you live, where you bundle up, but really let the air move in and out of your space. Don't let it turn into a kind of, a, you know, a, a sort of stagnant air space. So that's my biggest recommendation, actually, is, um, is working with air quality and then balancing Vata. That's my other main recommendation. Um, Okay, so respiratory issues are quite common this time of year. So Elizabeth is asking about this, suggestions. So like I was just saying with the way you condition your internal airspace, one factoid is that humans spend 90% of our time these days in man-made spaces. Our house or our dwelling is probably the number one man-made space. So finding ways to keep the air moving and then also to condition the air some of the citrus notes like grapefruit, um, lemon, uh, even orange, the, all of those citrus notes are going to be antimicrobial. A number of the, the essential oil companies make uh, specific blends that are either based on citrus or often on this combination that has clove and some other essential oils that's called Thieves. The original thing was called Thieves. And that's an, uh, another really great one to, to, to utilize. Internally, the main thing that you want to be careful with with the, with the lungs is around dairy and sugar. So dairy has a tropism to the lung. And that doesn't mean it's bad for the lung. If it's really, like if you're having you know, fresh milk from a cow, or you're having cheese that's made really well, or yogurt that's made from really, really good sources, um, dairy can be digestible and it can be beneficial. You know, in the case of the yogurt or something, it's obviously passing along some 
some um, excellent probiotics in the lactobacillus um, and uh, the bifidobacterium families, both of which are really essential to supporting immune function. So there's, so I'm not trying to say don't do it at all, but what can happen is, is if a person's overeating dairy or they're having low quality dairy or they're having a, you know, um, a lot of times actually homogenization can denature proteins in dairy and make it difficult to actually digest it just because of the homogenization and pasteurization. So you really have to pay close attention to whether you can have a dairy source and you know you're digesting it well. What's it going to feel like if you're digesting it well? You're going to feel great. You'll feel strong. Dairy is very strengthening when you can digest it, when it's a wholesome source. What's it going to feel like if you're not digesting it well? You're going to probably feel tired within a few minutes because your body starts to go into an immune response, and so it has to apportion energy to that immune response. Another aspect of the immune response will be um, sinus congestion, you know, and just mucus in general being increased. You may notice that your mood starts to change or that your, your mind starts to get more clouded and the, the quality of your, your mental clarity is diminished temporarily. You may get a stomach ache. You may get gas. A number of, all those things may be indicators. And so it's important, um, it's important to think about, um, and then, and then, well, think about not so much um, what you're eating, but how you react to it too. That's another really important, you know, point, which is that any food could be good for somebody. Any food could not be good for somebody. And so the main thing is to build up your sensitivity to the signs. And the signs I just mentioned are some of the main ones that a food that you've eaten is not landing well with your lungs. So what would be a couple of you know suggestions for great foods to eat? Generally speaking, they're foods that are white on the inside. So pears, apples, especially you can bake pears and apples and then add cinnamon and clove and nutmeg and kind of pumpkin pie spices in the winter time. That's excellent. Another um, thing that you is radishes. Radishes might be like one of the number one foods for the lung and it's actually a, a, a treatment for a cough to use radish and you boil it into a soup, into a tea. So you could get a big daikon radish or you get the little red radishes, cut them up, and then you can boil, you know, um, one daikon or a bunch of red radishes in like, say, four cups of water for about 15 minutes. And then another food that's actually an anti-cough food is, is honey. And I always recommend that you get an ethically sourced raw honey. And then wait till the tea is cooled down. You don't want to put honey into boiling hot tea because it'll cook the honey and make it, it creates a toxin. So you want it to be at room temperature, or not room temperature, but drinkably warm when you add the honey. You don't add to it, add it to it when it's boiling. And then another great, um, you know, food for the lung is, um, is almonds, you know, and, and so sprouting almonds and, and eating them or, you know, having almonds is a good, there are good lung foods. And you can look up these lists online. That was by, by no means, you know, exhausted, but I wanted to give a few key points there about sort of foods to be a little suspect of, like dairy and sugar, and then a few foods that are really supportive to the lung. All right, sometimes taking public transit. So there, this is where it's going to get a little more subtle. So all of the stuff I've been mentioning about city life, about balancing vata, um, what you can do if you're going to be on public transit would be an interesting thing to do is you actually take a little bit of a, of a you know, a good anti uh, kind of microbial essential oil and you put it inside of your mask. So it might be eucalyptus or tea tree oil or you might use a, a clovey blend or a citrus blend. But then every single breath you're taking, you're, you're getting that essential oil coming in. That's a really great barrier of protection. Another one too is, um, your immune system will be stronger if you're relaxed. So if you're on public transit, it's like 
you, you want to make sure it's like if you, even if you don't wear glasses you might get a pair of glasses you wear a hat you kind of have services covered while you're in the public transit so there's a little barrier and then um, do some slow deeper breathing while you're sitting in the public transit so that you're you're actually um, moving into the relaxation response because that will help to to boost your immune system and then if you choose to it's definitely not going to hurt a thing to actually feel like you have a protective aura and even if you visualize it whatever color to you appeals to you as a protective um, kind of color that you could visualize but I just think that with public transit it's like you want to be I would recommend actually having eyes open too so you're really aware of the environment but you're putting your internal space into a deeply relaxed state and you're actually then creating a kind of grace around you where your clothing is protecting you your um, the essential oil that you might use in the mask that you're wearing is protecting you and then you're creating an aura of protection as well so that's one little thought and then um, Karen so after receiving Panchakarma and Kerala is told not to eat cruciferous vegetables because they are an acne and eczema trigger I no longer eat them though they were a stable do you have any advice huh that's so interesting thank you Karen I've n I have not heard that and um, and I think now that it's been a couple of years, especially if you're, you know, your skin has improved, um, that you might try that again because, um, and actually radishes are, are, are technically cruciferous vegetables, so I should note that after my last, you know, answer a couple of answers ago, that you might think about that. Um, because they're just so great, you know, they have... For one thing, they have the most potent anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory nutrient on the planet. And it's, it, well, there's a deeper story to it, but it's called sulforaphane. And if you're having um, cruciferous vegetables with a little bit of mustard powder or mustard sauce with them, which is very common, of course, you know, a cruciferous vegetable like cabbage is often served with mustard, so as broccoli or, or Brussels sprouts or something like that. Um, but having, if you cook a cruciferous vegetable and then you have it with mustard, mustard powder or mustard uh, sauce, it actually creates the um, sulforaphane, which is really, really powerful, um, positive for the body. And so that's why I'm a little bit surprised. And at the same time, I'm also not in a position to say that I disagree because I would have to try that um, with patients to see if that was the link. In my training, what we really emphasize with skin stuff is alcohol, dairy, sugar, and seafood. And seafood may, there's some reasons behind that, but those are the things we really, you know, tell people to avoid to uh, uh, not trigger, you know, eczema and other skin flare-ups. But I've never heard that about cruciferous vegetables, and I love them. I've got to say that, too. I love cruciferous vegetables. <laughs> so I hope that's helpful. Um, well, and I should add, since I was on the subject there, that um, broccoli sprouts, sprouting the broccoli seeds, you know, eating the sprouts of the broccoli seeds, are off the charts more sulforaphane, you near know, pound for pound, than any other food source. So um, that's one, one more plug for sulforaphane, which is just an excellent thing to get regularly in your diet. Another good source of sulforaphane is actually moringa, which is an Ayurvedic herb and a superfood. Moringa, M-O-R-I-N-G-A. And that you can just make and you can, you can put it into smoothies or you can just stir it up in water and drink it. So moving on, we're gonna, we've got just a few more minutes here. I'm gonna try to, ooh, okay, there's a list. I'm gonna try to get through as many of these as I can. So maybe at the moment I'm gonna close the, uh, the question window. So please, if you, if you have a burning question, you have to ask it, go ahead and put that up there. But if, you're, if you can, um, I'll just work through the rest of these. All right, can you explain why the cold blasts at the end of the shower? What is the mechanism that happens biology? 
biological events, Jennifer. So it's two things from the immune system perspective. What it does is it triggers a major lymphatic movement. And in that movement, it actually stimulates the macrophage activity. So macrophages are, are a, a, they literally mean big mouth, and they are. They, they're a, a part of your immune system that, that does you know, consume uh, you know, antigens you know, or you know, bacteria and other things. Um, so you get a heightened activity of the macrophages, and then the other part that's more, um, and then just any time your, your lymphatic system is facilitated, you're going to have a reduction in inflammation, um, and your immune system will be sort of not sedated, but it will be calmed down and balanced. So that's one of the basic things. And the hot-cold alternation is the heart of naturopathic medicine. And I'm not trained as a naturopath. I'm trained in Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. But I, I started a clinic with a naturopath and have had some interesting conversations about this alternation of hot and cold. And they use that really extensively for healing in that system. Um, then from the brain perspective, the, you have certain um, you have n certain increases of, of neurotransmitters like norepinephrine, which is excellent for focus and memory, and also it increases something called BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotropic factor. And what that is is something that promotes uh, the growth and plasticity of the brain in general. So that's my answer to that. All right, Monica's question. What's your number one way to cope during this time? How do you keep stress down? You know, my number one, actually, during right now, and it's been such an intense period of time, my number one way to do, to cope right now, is I actually have a ritual, almost daily, mostly daily, where I, we have a biomat, which is just a, a glorified heating pad. It does have... Um, it does have, uh, what's the word, what's the stone? Anyway, it has, it has a mineral in it, and I can't believe I'm forgetting that. But what it is, is you could use a hot pad, some, a, a, a hot water bottle. You could, it's, uh, you could, or you could use an, a biomat. It has amethyst, is what the stone that's in it. And the biomat, because of the amethyst, generates an infrared um, field. So if you had an infrared sauna, that would do the same thing. But what I do is I basically get, I cover myself with a weighted blanket, but I also have, in my case, I use the, the biomat, but you could use a water bottle or a couple of water bottles. Um, you could use a heating pad. I really love water bottles because the, the kind of deluxe version would be like a couple under each knee, one on the low abdomen. Um, and then you rest, and I rest with the weighted blanket on, and a weighted blanket is like, typically they're about 12 pounds if you buy them, you know, on the market. If you get them custom made, you can get them any weight you want, but um, I would just use a regular one, and it's 12 pounds. And so the weighted blanket has a, an abundance of research for anxiety, um, and for just the, the weight itself calming the body. So this is... This is classic Fata reduction, which is you put something heavy on the body to kind of swaddle it, and then the nervous system calms down because of the security of the weight. And then you also put something warm. And then what I do is I don't use eye pillows, but I do like to cover my eyes like with a, some cloth or a shirt or something like that. And then I also listen to um, some Hertz music. And so what I mean by Hertz is is H H Z is the, the acronym for Hertz, and it's a sign for frequency. And so the researchers that have studied what different frequencies do to the mind and the body, there's this whole world on any um, streaming music service on YouTube, whereas if you type in H Z music, you'll find one of the most prominent ones is 528, there's 432, there's 417, there's 796, they're 396. There's a there's a bunch of hertz, and then they'll make you know it gets a little woo woo in the sense of they're saying you know you do this and you'll go into cosmic consciousness. But the truth is, it's resonant with very subtle um, brainwave states, 
it's resonant with our DNA, that in the case of the 528, that's the, that's the frequency of your DNA, is 528 hertz. So the music that comes from that, that frequency will be the same frequency that your DNA is resonating at. And they've actually, um, the interesting thing is the, you know, the, um, the sort of choral music that comes out of, 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 of Europe the choir music, the singing often creates a 528 hertz frequency. So humans have been creating this frequency in various ways with sacred music through, you know, forever, but now you can, you know, find it online. And, and so what I do is I, I listen to the frequency music, I have my eyes covered, I've got my body is weighted down, and then I am warm. I'm getting, I'm profoundly warm. And so it's like, um, I will often, even if I don't fall asleep, I'll feel like I took a nap, even after 15 minutes of that. So usually once a day, I spend somewhere between 50, 15 and 25 minutes um, in that kind of meditation. And then I just internally go through and, and just deeply relax. So I think this time of year, it's very, um, it's, you, it's good to employ um, things that bring profound stillness into your system. And then Sean asks about Palo, pa, Palo Santo. Palo Santo, you know, my guess is it's probably got some immune boosting. It's such an incredibly beautiful aroma. But this goes back to, you know, that's the kind of thing, if you love it, then it's going to be good for everything. So just think of it as a kind of sensual... Um, promotion, you know, it's like you're you're indulging the sense of smell because you love Palo Santo, and then that's the kind of thing. And it's always good with something like Palo Santo because it is uh, a sacred wood that comes from the Amazon. Just you know, be very, you know, be judicious about it um, because it's easy for um, for us to become enamored of things and then just use a bunch of it. And so I'm. I'm, I usually, for myself, I use Palo Santo in rituals, um, and so I limit it to that space where I'm going to be in a space of kind of, in a kind of sacred reciprocity with, I'm in the process of offering gratitude to reality with a capital R, and so that employing something like Palo Santo is a beautiful way to um, carry that intention into the subtle um, realm and space that exists. Are any of those essentials toxic to dogs when breathed? Thanks, Susan. That's a really great question, and I don't have an answer for that because I'm not an expert on essential oils, but I think it would be something worth looking up. So thank you for bringing that up because I, I know that um, sometimes animals react to things very, very differently than humans. So sorry, I don't have an answer. And then Mia, any suggestions for supporting the thyroid adrenals pancreas during the holiday time, including sp spices to highlight, promote resilience? Okay, so this is, you know, the, this, this kind of elongated or this kind of, you could say, enhanced Shavasana that I was just mentioning. This is an excellent way to support adrenals, thyroid, pancreas excellent excellent way to support those because those things they do work together and often if there is a challenge to any of those systems fundamentally we need to rejuvenate the body because those glandular systems are like at the deepest level of our body and so f rejuvenation is is a is kind of about moving the resources that nourish us off of the more superficial tissues into the deeper tissues. And if you're familiar with Ayurvedic terminology, you know, we're talking about maja um, and shukra dhatu, ojas, nourishing those levels, which the key there is regularity, consistency of those kind of practices. From a kind of, you know, a spice um, perspective, um, in general, all cooking spices are medicine, and all cooking spices are going to support pancreas function. Um, specifically, I always, when I think of supporting thyroid function, the two herbs, these aren't spices, they're herbs. The combination is ashwagandha and gotu kola. That combination, if you combine it with a little licorice, it's great. If you have it with seaweed, 
So depending on the kind of thyroid support you need, you want to make sure you're getting some dietary source of, of iodine, and seaweed is an excellent um, dietary source. And you don't you want to eat normal amounts. You don't have to supplement it or try to like you know really kind of drastically increase how much you're using it. But basically, that's your that's your emphasis there is is have sea vegetables, and then with ashwagandha and goat cola, there's a number of preparations that put them together. One of my favorite ones comes from a company called Standard Process, and they, I think, even though if you looked up Standard Process and Thyroid Support, they have an herbal blend that is actually, it is Gotu Kola, Ashwagandha, and Bladder Rack Seaweed. It's those three together. And so, um, you know, that's a good way to do it. But this is, you know, in terms of the deeper support, um, the um, it's it's a lot about rejuvenation. It's about rest and, and deep relaxation and, and kind of managing anxiety because you know, stress and anxiety is one of the main things that will disturb the function of all three of those organs. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, so Sean's noticing more phlegm in the upper throat, especially with an at one hour of intake. That seems to occur during fall and spring transitions. Um, that kind of thing where you get a little bit of phlegm in the upper throat is often means that you're, you're eating something that's not agreeing with you. Even if you're familiar with it, it may not be totally agreeing with you because that phlegm in the upper throat is actually a sign that the liver isn't processing whatever you're having so well. So one way to help is make sure that you include sour things regularly in your, in your food, not excessively, but like a little kombucha, some vinegar, lemon or lime juice. All of those things will help to promote the movement of the liver. And then in general, just eating a, a very liver-friendly diet, which is gonna be like, some protein, but not excessive protein. Definitely limiting, li, uh, limiting alcohol and sugar. Definitely limi limiting processed foods and fried foods. You know, those kind of things. Definitely getting enough, you know, water and hydration. So that's a few suggestions. There's a, there is a great Chinese formula for that kind of phlegm but you can also work with it just by reducing the amount of cuffagenic foods, cuffa-increasing foods that you eat, or phlegm-promoting food, foods that you eat. And during these seasons, when you notice that it spikes up for you, pay really close attention because you may actually be getting a little bit of phlegm from foods that you normally don't just because the transition is shifting the way your, your system is functioning and digesting. What about white mushrooms, Asian and Western? Thanks, Ashley. Um, I'm a mushroom fan. I think that um, you know, mo mushrooms are great. They should be cooked. That's my one, especially portobello and button mushrooms. You should cook them. Don't eat them raw. But yes, white mushrooms are, are, are great. Um, um, and in general, like shiitake are also a kind of white mushroom. And shiitake are very well known to be a uh, an immune boosting um, mushroom or immune supporting because they also have a lot of um, you know, credibility around people who are trying to resolve cancer. All right, moving down. Owen, should people with gut fatigue pain issues avoid gluten even if it doesn't produce immediate symptoms? Um, you know, if you're having that kind of experience with gut pain um, fatigue, uh, you, it's always a good idea to do some elimination diet type of work. So the simple answer is yes, but it is also true that a lot of people who aren't gluten sensitive um, are eliminating gluten because the anti-gluten lobby is so vociferous. And that's just to say that you know, they're really making their voices heard and a lot of them will say things like, we should never eat gluten, which is, that's... Um, that's contentious and it's just to say that I'm not saying everybody should eat gluten because there are people who have allergies to it and usually if you have a strong allergy to gluten 
the effect that it will have on your digestion will be quite immediate. But that doesn't mean that for you it might not be, it might be that in the process of digesting it, the symptoms take some time to show up. So it's always useful where you could take gluten out for two weeks or a month and see how that affects your symptoms. It's always smart with elimination diets to do one thing at a time so you can actually track what's changing and its effect. Lavender and mint is a good mix. Thanks, Sean, definitely. I mean, Jennifer is, is, is uh, loving lavender and thyme. Thyme is a great lung, uh, a, a great spice for the lung. So is lavender. But if you're making soups, like you can make like a, a barley mushroom soup with thyme as the spice note, that's just a wonderful, um, really nutritious and supportive soup if you can digest barley. Again, because I know that grains are also getting a lot of bad press from certain factions of the nutritional world and if you don't digest something don't eat it and so I'm, I'm not at all saying everybody should eat barley but if you can digest it there's really really excellent research too supporting it as a, as a grain that supports health and in the traditional Chinese medical tradition they use it extensively especially for things like skin conditions and um, conditions where you're holding excess fluid where you have edema promote uh, some diuretic effect. All right, Payal. For people who struggle with high FODMAP foods, what do you suggest? Is this due to AMA buildup or part of the natural aging process for some people? Yes. You know, that's a great question. So the simple answer is, if you do struggle with high FODMAP foods, it can be really important to stick close to the low FODMAP diet. And, but the reason for that happening it could definitely be that you've got built up AMA, but the problem nowadays is we are living in an environment that's in an, it's in an, in an unprecedented situation about how many new factors, air pollutants, water pollutants, um, things that are in your environment, in houses and man-made structures, um, things that are in food, people eating, you know, getting addicted to foods that are creating AMA. You know, there's, there's so many reasons why somebody might have a deterioration or somebody who's taken antibiotics, you know, extensively where the digestive tract has been injured in some way because of um, whatever. And so it's very hard to pin it down, but it is true also that the gut, the, micro, the, the microbiome tends to become less diverse during the aging process. So... Um, the main way to work with trying to support um, the most robust digestive capacity from a gut perspective is to increase diversity of plant foods that you're eating, but you also have to pay attention to whether you digest them or not. So that's important too. All right, thank you, Ashley, for saying thank you. Um, <laughs> Standing in place with my face facing the fresh window, wind like a puppy. That's a great call too, if you can. Um, I like that suggestion. And then, um, let's see. What pranayama would be most beneficial right now? Warming but not too stimulating. Ujjayi, are there considerations around pranayama to consider for this time of year? I find there's a fine line between keeping prana regulated and flowing and having it get out of hand. I've heard and experienced that wearing a hat, having oil on the skin is useful to keep the product in check. Yes to hat and, and oil on the skin. And I actually am encouraging folks to do some gentle, um, you know, hyperventilation techniques like either Kapalabhati or Bastrika. And when I say it's, it's kind of oxymoronic to say gentle hyperventilation, but there's a difference between going like 10 or 20 times where it takes you less than half a minute to do it and doing it for five minutes. If I do it for short blasts, I'm going to be oxygenating the blood, I'm going to be stimulating the system, and then if I follow that with a really slow ujjayi breath, it helps to actually pull the oxygen that I've oxygenated the blood with into the tissues and then increase CO2 levels in the blood and then that has an effect of having a net calming effect 
and also you know balancing you know it, it creates a balancing effect where you won't end up knocking vata out, out of balance while you can still employ some of these warming and stimulating breaths like kapalabhati or bastrika so i think ujjayi is great and i also think a little bit of those you know either bastrika or kapalabhati are excellent pranayamas for this time of year and then Jennifer adds, Moringa is great in matcha. Ooh, nice. I will definitely try that. And then, um, yes, and then people are affirming that the amethyst, any suggestions for the weight of a person around 150 pounds? They sell so many. The rule of thumb with weighted blankets is that the blanket is ideally 10% of the body weight. So if you were a 150 pound person, which is what I weigh, you would have a 15 pound blanket. With that said, I use a 12 pound blanket and I find that to be plenty heavy. So I think um, you, know, you, can, you can go with it. The general rule of thumb is 10%. And then um, this. Um, yes, great. Thank you, Mia. That's a good synopsis. The key is to rest deeply and move our resources that nourish us from the surface to deeper levels to rejuvenate and promote others. That's the name of the game right now. And because your Agni is stronger this time of year, your digestive fire is, is increased, your body has more capacity to actually do that if you take the time. Right, thyroid complex from standard process. That's a, I, I think that's an excellent product. Um, the body bucky during these times. Any recommendations for grinding teeth? Grinding teeth is quite complex, Nancy, so it's hard to answer, but it is to say often grinding teeth is something that sets up from more than one uh, reason. Two really common ones can be some kind of digestive disturbance. Something like parasites is very commonly going to trigger that. And then another um, example is something like, uh, a, a, you know, kind of sustained emotional frustration of whatever kind either that somebody's experiencing too much of an emotion that they can't process it's it's overwhelming or they're repressing an emotion because it's too painful and it feels too dangerous to experience it for them psychologically so those those are a couple of suggestions around teeth grinding all in all though get a night guard I mean that's the bottom line with, with grinding, which is called bruxism in sort of dental terminology, you really do not want to grind your teeth down. And so if you know that you're grinding, um, look deeper into digestion, emotional, um, relational kind of realms, but, but as a first basic thing, you know, get some kind of a night guard where you're wearing a, um, you can even go to like a, you know, a, a CVS or a pharmacy and get a mouth guard that you would use for athletics, you know, and then you, you know, you don't have to, the ones that are really tailored to your teeth are, are usually quite expensive from the dentist, and if you need something simple, just go get a, um, you know, like an athletic mouth guard and get it, you know, check it out and make sure it's comfortable, but then often, you know, you use hot water or boiling water to soften it, and then you imprint your teeth on it, and you can wear that at night, too. Um, okay. Great. Mia Rose is a mycologist and agreed with the cooking the mushrooms. Thank you for um, <laughs> thank you for for backing me up on that. I have heard that too, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, maybe at some point I would love to hear more about why that's so. Any recommendations for staying asleep? Okay, so really basic because I do have to go. Um, basically, for staying asleep, what you can think about is that um, melatonin and GABA are your and serotonin they all work together to help you fall asleep and stay asleep melatonin is a little better for getting you in to sleep GABA G-A-B-A -A, which stands for gamma aminobutyric acid which is one of the main it is the, the, the most powerful calming neurotransmitter that we have um, GABA keeps you asleep Magnesium, the mineral magnesium, is also another excellent one. Magnesium glycinate is a form. Glycinate is G-L-Y-C-I-N-A-T-E. That is a form of, of magnesium that can be helpful to helping you sleep because magnesium plays an important role in actually helping 
not serotonin turn into melatonin as well as to enforcing the activity and mediating the activity of GABA in our system. Of course, the um, so sometimes winding down is hard, but I have a good night routine that usually helps with that. And finally, I, okay, yeah. So if you're only finding you're sleeping about six hours, then I really recommend that you that you think about potentially getting a good GABA source, and then um, that in combination with say 500 milligrams of magnesium can be uh, a help for getting you in and keeping you there. And then. Um, Neural tension is also significant with teeth grinding. Thanks for putting that out there, Sean. And so neural tension, I assume that would be kind of underlying agitation and, um, and also subluxation and just problems when the nervous system is being stimulated. Trauma sympathetic dominance as well. Thanks, Nancy. Of course. That's, and that's, that's kind of, I think, a lot of what underlies teeth grinding actually is some kind of basic sympathetic dominance often based on some kind of traumatic experience as blood strikes. Tessa Lawrence. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, thank you for reinforcing that about the night guard because you once you grind your teeth down, it's incredibly expensive to get new teeth, so just try to protect them before they are grinded down. Um, yeah, okay, so Linda, with the repetitive use and thumb pain, that's a tough one. It's a longer answer, but I would just say you would want to look into some exercises that would be counter to the position. So if you're in this position on the keyboard, this position where the thumb is in bed, is extended, is going to be a counter, and you just keep, you might even set an alarm on your clock where every 15 or 20 minutes you do something where you actually reverse that movement and then you hold, where you're actually taking the thumb in the entirely opposite direction, taking the wrist in the opposite direction as a counterbalance. But it can be much deeper than that, especially if there's already some tendonitis or something going on. And so it's, it's a practice. Yeah, and then Susan's mentioning that she finds CBD is great for good night's sleep. No THC in it. Some people experience that, and, um, and so thank you for bringing that up. Some people will often find that a very small amount of THC is key to making the CBD work. And I've talked to some very high level scientists who really know this stuff and there's still contention. Some of them say the CBD doesn't work without a little bit of THC. Some of them say it can work without it. But the truth is that it seems in my clinical observation, just a few people, is that there's definitely some people that don't need the THC and there's definitely some people that seem to need a little THC with the CBD to have a little bit. Usually don't give Claudia, I don't usually give sugar to my two-year-old, but in the dates that she has, uh, in the, uh, but in these days that she has access to a lot of it. Yes, this is the curse of this time of year. And so main thing I would say is with that is, you know, try to regulate it as much as you can. Ta try to encourage her to eat fruit when she's eating candy because a little bit of fruit will actually regulate the blood sugar and mitigate some of the bad effects of the sugar. The other thing is start boosting vitamin C with a child that young that's, you know, having a little more, um, you know, sugar because the sugar is going to definitely deplete the immune system. So having a little more vitamin C will at least support it some. All right, so next is what about the opposite? Trouble falling asleep, trouble getting up in the morning. Um, thanks, Carrie. So the opposite there is... Um, the basically if you have trouble falling asleep i recommend melatonin i also recommend get really good with your nighttime routine so that you're really kind of you're like a plane coming in for a landing in the last two hours before bed everything you're doing is setting you up to be able to do that and then if you're having trouble getting up in the morning that's really common if you're having trouble falling asleep i would say that when you can don't force yourself to get up it's good to keep a rhythm but within maybe give yourself like a 30 or 45 minute range where if you're really, really dragging when you first open your eyes in the morning, let yourself stay in bed. This is the time of year for hibernation. So this is a particularly good time of year to allow yourself to have a little longer time just, you know, chilling. 
and waking up slow and just being with yourself both physically and emotionally in a way where you can kind of feel into to what's there. The morning's often very revealing and it's also a great opportunity to, uh, to be with yourself. So if you have trouble getting up, you might try waking up but then staying in bed and just being intuitive about how you meet yourself in that moment. All right. Um, all right. So good. Well, thank you, everybody. It's been great being here, too. Um, and um, yeah, so I, this was enjoyable. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a point to do this more often. So hopefully do this at least once a month. And um, so be well, everybody. Sending love to all of you. And I hope you have um, a safe and happy holiday season. And, um, and I'll see you sometime after the new year. And we, the, there's a wellness course that's coming for the whole winter. So keep your eyes open for that. We'll be posting that up on, on um, you know, social media and whatnot, too. And so that's going to be called Tending the Fire, and we'll be sending out the invite um, any day now. So keep your eyes open for that. Hey, Melina, good to see you. All right, take care, everybody. Bye.